Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Charles Gauthier, and I'm the coordinator of this seminar series. Uh, I just wanted to say welcome to the first Permafrostnet, uh, Permafrostnet seminar series. Thank you for joining us today. Without further ado, I will introduce Maria. So uh, Maria carried out her master's degree at the University of Waterloo under the supervision of Professor Claude Duguay. Maria uh, graduated from Western University with a specialization in geographic information science. Her current research interest is the observation and analysis of the thermocast lake dynamics in the Canadian subarctic. She's looking to ad identify representative sites, explore time trends observed through microwave remote sensing, and attempt to understand the changes occurring in the underlying permafrost. The focus of her master's work is the application of the deep learning techniques to the microwave image time series of the Canadian thermocast landscapes. Uh, so Maria, if you want to please share your screen and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to share my, my research. Uh, as Charles said, I, I just finished my master's with uh, Claude Duguay. And of course, this research would not be possible without um, PermafrostNet support, Team 3, uh, also Pascal from Team 4, and the Yukon University team that helped me with collecting some field data this past April. So uh, today we will talk about lake ice, we will talk about how it relates to permafrost, and I will describe to you the method that I propose for uh, mapping lake ice from space. Uh, <clears throat> and also how I applied this method to attempt to understand the changes in lake ice in Old Crow Flats, Yukon, Canada, which is my study area. Okay, so first let's make the link between satellites, lake ice, and permafrost. Um, so Arctic and subarctic regions underlain by permafrost, they are rich in lakes which formed as a result of ground subsidence caused by uh, permafrost thaw. These lakes are called thermocarst lakes. And here on the right, you can see a photo of uh, one of the thermocarst lakes in Old Crow Flats, and the Yukon team is surveying the lake ice. Um, so generally, thermocarst lakes are shallow, so close to the shore, as we can see here in the photograph, we likely have ice which reaches the lake bed, which is called bedfast ice, and you can see it as well on the diagram on the left. And in deeper portions, we will have floating ice, um, or sometimes the lake can be completely uh, bedfast if it's, if it's a more shallow lake. Uh, so, this is relevant, very relevant to permafrost because as the climate um, warms, less common lakes are expected to have bedfast ice. Uh, we will have longer periods of water presence under the, under the ice, which uh, changes the heat storage, leads to formation of areas of flood ground under the lake and surrounding the lake. Um, <clears throat> and this, as such, the, the permafrost degradation triggers uh, many other positive feedbacks uh, promoting further, further warming, uh, including release of organic uh, carbon and methane, which are stored in the permafrost and which are potent greenhouse gases. So this is why it is very, very important to constantly and consistently monitor what is happening with bedfast ice, uh, <clears throat> as, as it is very helpful for understanding and predicting permafrost change. Now, a number of lakes in, in Arctic and subarctic regions uh, is vast. So we have to resort to remote sensing for monitoring it. And microwave remote sensing, uh, specifically synthetic aperture radar, it allows us to distinguish between bedfast and floating ice from space. Uh, so as you can see here in the diagram, the, the sub platform sends out a signal and listens to the backscatter. So for floating ice, we will have the signal bounce right back from the interface between water and ice. And for uh, this way, we will have on a grayscale uh, star image, we will have a bright signature for floating ice as the signal bounced back. But for bedfast ice, the signal is generally absorbed or transmitted into the sediment underneath the lake, which means we will have a dark signature. Also, uh, SAR can penetrate clouds and uh, it can operate at night, which makes it really suitable for northern regions. 
All right, so, so my goal was to create an automatic framework for mapping lake ice using microwave sensing. Um, then I wanted to use that framework to study how lake ice uh, that changed over time in old cow flats, and this way facilitate future study of permafrost in the area. Of course, there are many successful methods which uh, map bed fast and floating ice from SAR. However, my method is different from them in, in three major aspects. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, floating ice appears bright, bed fast ice appears dark. However, grayscale is continuous. So where we draw that line between bed fast ice and floating ice can be tricky. Uh, <clears throat> this is why in, in, in this approach, I propose instead of looking at one timestamp, uh, looking at the entire um, ice season from early October to mid-March. Um, <clears throat> also, my method automatically map, maps star imagery into three classes, bed fast ice, floating ice, and land. Um, so usually, usually uh, methods map only the lakes and themselves, only the ice. So the lakes have to be extracted first. This means that we need a lake mask, which is challenging to create for areas where lake outlines are constantly changing, which is the case for, for old crowd flats. And finally, I'm hoping that this method is more universal. It can be applied to different uh, SAR platforms. Uh, it can work with uh, both HH and BB polarization and it doesn't require incidence angle uh, adjustments. All right, so just a little bit about the study area. So here we see um, an optical image of old cow flats in the Yukon, Canada. Uh, white are the, are the ice and snow covered lakes and brown is the surrounding ground. <clears throat> so old cow flats is a wetland underlain by continuous permafrost. It is very rich in lakes, has over 2,500 shallow thermocarst lakes. Um, its outlines of the lakes are dynamic. Um, so this is why we, we don't want to create a lake mask. And this is why this method is, is beneficial because it doesn't require a lake mask. Uh, in the north, we mostly have tundra. In the south, it's boreal forest. And we have combination. Uh, of the two somewhere in the middle. Also, uh, Old Crow Flats is a homeland of wounded witch and First Nations. And based on, on the research that I read, uh, uh, they note that, that the climate is changing, that um, temperatures are changing, precipitation is changing. They notice that there are a lot of drainage, lake drainage events, and that, that lake ice is changing. This is why this area was so um, it was a good choice for studying lake ice dynamics. All right, so here is just a, a summary a summary of my methods. So first of all, because I'm using a deep learning approach, I had to create a large annotated data set, a labeled data set, which included three different classes, bed fast ice, protein ice, and land. So I uh, got all the SAR imagery from 1993 to 2021, which I could and processed it. My second step, was to uh, use a temporal deep learning from framework, which was proposed by Pelletier in 2019 for land cover classification from optical imagery. And then I adapted that framework for lake ice mapping from SAR. Um, then uh, using the data set that I created in step one, I trained and tested the network. And in step three, I used the trained network to create lake ice maps for old cow flats. Assess the, and assess the accuracy based on field data and uh, Canadian lake ice model predictions. And in step four, I attempted to, to make some sense of what is happening with lake ice in all crowd flats over the past 30 years. Uh, all right, so I started, as I mentioned, by creating a, a, a large annotated data set, and I obtained data from three platforms, ERS 1 and 2, um, Sentinel 1 and Radar Set 1 uh, from 1993 to 2021, between my images for each of the years is between October to mid March. Um, then I stacked those images for every year and labeled around uh, 129,000 time series into three classes, which I've already mentioned that fast ice, floating ice, and land. So here, if we look at the graph, 
this is just an example of some of the label time series from my data set. We can notice that land, which I show here in green, has little variability over the ice season compared to lake ice, which changes a lot. It goes through life cycles, through, through its life cycle. So we have bad fast ice in dark blue, uh, floating ice in light blue. And for, for both of them, initially, we can see that drop in backscatter as the ice forms. Um, and it covers the, the water surface, which is generally roughened by wind. So once we have thin ice, we get specular reflection away from the sensor, which creates darker signature, lower backscatter. And then as the ice grows and thickens, we have a higher, higher backscatter. And then for floating ice, it remains high. For bad fast ice, we see a drop uh, somewhere in midwinter. Now, because sensors have different temporal uh, resolution, I had to interpolate to a daily frequency to compensate for that. So I have, uh, for each of my time series, 161 um, data points uh, for every of the days between October uh, and mid-March. All right, so um, since I'm exploring a temporal deep learning uh, and I adopted the framework um, temporal convolutional neural network proposed by Pelletier et al, as I already mentioned. Um, convolutional neural networks are known to be, um, they're known to be very good at extracting spatial patterns. So they're usually used, used for that. However, here we have a one dimensional temporal convolution instead of a spatial convolution. So what does this mean? Temporal convolution is then, is when a network applies different kinds of filters to that time series, trying to extract some important features in, in that time series. So for example, here I'm showing two examples um, of filters. One filter is extracting the trend, other filter is extracting the cycling component. So as, as the network is training, it learns to identify which of those filters are most useful for creating correct classification. All right. So once I had my data set and I had my, my um, temporal convolutional neural network structure, I, I did a set of experiments to determine what is, what is the best number of units for my convolutional layers. Um, and once I performed those experiments based on overall accuracy, I selected a structure which had 64 units in each of the convolutional layers. And then I tested it also through a series of experiments and my uh, um, overall accuracy was between 91 and 99% with a mean of 95%. Okay, so just to summarize the methods. So first we have a stack of SAR images uh, from October to March. We trace each of the points from the very top, from the very first image to the very last image, which I show here in red. And this way we obtain time series and we interpolate that time series to a daily frequency to have a, a continuous continuous data. Then each of the time series goes into the network and through its many layers, the network makes a decision whether this, this pixel belongs to bad fast ice, floating ice, or land. And once all of the pixels in that image stack go through the network, we at the end have a lake ice map with three classes, which we can further analyze. Okay, now I will show you some examples of those lake ice maps. Um, first, we will look at a map created from ERS based on the uh, season of 1992-1993. Um, here is the map that was created by the, the temporal convolutional neural network trained on my data set. Uh, here you can see dark blue represents bed fast ice, light blue is, is floating ice, and light green is the surrounding land. Uh, the, the, the trouble with ERS is, is its sparse temporal coverage. So for some years, I had very few full scenes. For others, there were more. So there had to be an extensive interpolation then. Um, however, the spatial resolution of ERS is, is pretty high, so we could resolve um, smaller details. Here is an example of Rita set one, which had the lowest spatial resolution. And here is an example of a um, uh, lake ice map created for Sentinel-1, which is the most clear and clean. And I believe this to, to the reason for this to be um, 
regular temporal coverage and a good number of scenes for, for every ice season, even though the spatial resolution is slightly lower than for ERS. All right, so, so far we've been talking about statistical evaluation of accuracy based on my um, of, based on the label set that I created. However, to really assess uh, how, how accurate it is lake map, ice maps represent, they represent the, the, my study area, it is always good to look at field data um, and put it in the context of atmospheric conditions. So due to um, scarce lake ice region measurements in all parallel flats, I also used CLIMO uh, Canadian Lake Ice Model ice thickness simulations to make some context for my results. Um, so Old Crow Flats, as, as I already mentioned, has both tundra and taiga. In uh, tundra, we expect to have uh, thicker ice as we have more distribution of snow by wind. Uh, the snow is denser and thinner, so we have thicker ice and in taiga, the snow is, is um, thicker, less dense, so the ice is usually thinner. So here you can see the climo simulations um, of ice thickness for, for the entire time period. In With dots, I indicate the end date of my time series, which is March 13. Um, yeah, so, so those, uh, those simulations were, were made for me by Claude and Mark from my research group. Um, and I just wanted to thank them here for helping me out. Okay, uh, so although I mentioned that the field data are scarce, I, I was kindly provided with some field data. Uh, I had access to 10 drill hole data collected in April 2009, uh, four drill holes from, 2000, uh, from 2021, this, this past April. Uh, so here in the table, I'm just showing the data from 2009. Um, yeah, so, so let's just look in more detail at the table. So we have ice thickness, um, we have lake depth. So when ice thickness is less than lake depth, the regime is floating. When it is equal, the regime is bad fast. And then the next column shows the output of my model, output of the temp CNN, um, what kind of regime was predicted for those locations. So for the first eight points, which are located in Tundra, uh, all of them were predicted correctly, except for the very first one, which instead of being floating is labeled as land. Uh, however, the drill holes are made pretty close to the shore. Uh, so in combination with, uh, with um, pixel size uh, and the drill hole being, being close to the shore, we have this mixing of the signal from the land and from the lake. So I, I, it is not surprising that it could be labeled as land. And for the two tiger locations, again, we have one point labeled correctly as floating and one point labeled as land, I believe for the same reasons. I also had access to some bathymetry measurements, which I'm showing here um, on the right side on the graph. Uh, I'm going to try to explain what, what I'm showing here. So on the X, Oh, sorry, on the y-axis, we have uh, depth, lake depth, which was collected in the field. Uh, then the points, the, the color of the points indicates the, the label which was assigned to those points by my model. Uh, the shape of them shows the vegetation, which is around the lake. And we also have horizontal lines, which show the ice thickness predicted for that year. So we can see that there are three dark blue points. These are the points which were classified by the model as bad fast, and they are logically located above the respective uh, climb or predicted ice thickness. Here the ice is, the depth of the lake um, is less than the predicted ice thickness. Thus the points are bad fast, which makes sense. Everything located below both of the lines is mostly blue which is floating, again, makes sense since the depth here is greater than the ice thickness predicted by, by the model. Uh, we have a couple of points in between. The two triangles logically fall there as they are in, located in taiga. They're under the taiga line, so they're floating. The two other points mm, could be a misclassification. However, we should note that climb was very sensitive to the input parameters of snow depth and density, so that would be under or over estimation. And again, there is only one point of land. I, I looked at where it's located, it's a small pond. Again, we could have this um, 
issue of pixel size and contamination of the lens signal. All right, so now let's transition to looking at the changes in old crowd flats. So here I suggest we, we trace one of the lakes for time from 1993 to 2021. This lake is known as uh, Husky Lake. And um, so for some years, we can see that uh, ice is floating, light blue. Other years, it's mostly bad fast, dark blue. Uh, so we can see that there is quite a bit of interannual um, variability. Uh, this variability aligned well with the climal ice thickness simulations. Uh, and I noticed that for years where Climo predicted ice to be thinner than 1.14 meters, we generally have a floating label, which makes sense uh, for years where ice was predicted to be greater than 1.29 uh, meters, we generally have bad fast label. However, when we're in the range between 1.21 and 1.23 meters, the label fluctuates. Uh, so I believe that in, during those years, the lake ice was close to the depth of the lake. This is why we have that fluctuation. And also Climo has an uncertainty of about five to six centimeters. Um, so, so there could be, could be this uncertainty. Uh, now, I also noticed that sometimes the, the ice regime was influenced by water level changes. So for example, in 2005, water level, as we can see on the, on the Landsat images, was drawn down. Uh, and as a result, in 2006, we have bad fast ice, um, even though climal ice thickness was predicted to be, the ice was predicted to be thinner for that year. OK, so here I am looking at overall changes between the very first year of the series, 1993, and 2021. And I'm highlighting three types of changes. It's transition from bad fast ice to floating ice, which is light blue, from floating ice to bad fast ice, dark blue, and floating to land, which is green. Um, I'm going to go over all of those examples, that, which I show as zoom-ins in, in, in the next slides. Um, but here, I just want to, to, to summarize a little bit. So overall, I see that uh, lake drainage and refilling events have a lot of influence on, on the ice regime change. We also have a contribution from uh, interannual variability. So for example, winter of 1993 was warmer than 2021. So we expect to see more bad fast ice. Uh, and looking at ice fractions over the years, I've noticed that the bad fast ice fraction grew. So we started at around 12% um, of ice being bad fast and transitioned to, to about 25% of ice being bad fast by the end of the time period. Um, all right, let's now go into the examples. So first we'll look at Zelma Lake, which I showed here um, in the top left corner. Uh, it is known that Zelma Lake drained catastrophically around 2007. And we can notice that before that, we have mostly floating lake ice. And then starting in 2008, we transitioned to having mostly bad fast ice as the lake lost most of its um, water area. Uh, we have some floating ice sometimes in 2018, 2019, but those years were warmer. Um, but overall, the drainage here we can see is associated with transition from floating ice regime to a bed fast ice regime. This is another example. This is natural lake. I showed it here in light blue. So this lake transitioned from bed fast to mostly floating. So here, if we look at it, it was mostly uh, bed fast originally, and then it slowly transitioned to being mostly floating. What is interesting about this lake is that it's also known to have drained catastrophically, but long time ago in 1972, but it appears that the lake has refilled, and as a result, we have a change in, in ice regime. And finally, there are some other lakes which haven't been mentioned in other studies, but I believe that they also drained. Uh, here in Landsat image, we can see the reduction in, in water surface area. And on the left, I'm showing a change map. So dark blue represents areas which transitioned from being floating to being that fast. Okay, just to, to conclude. So first of all, I found that the temporal deep learning approach is promising for 
consistent monitoring of leak ice from space. Um, it is very important for permafrost to monitor bedfast ice as they're closely linked together. This is also important. The lake ice maps are also important for emission and ecological studies, as well as for local communities, as they can indicate where there is fresh water available under the ice, and we can identify lakes which provide overwintering fish habitat. Uh, also, as the quality and temporal frequency, especially of um, radar imagery grows and new star satellites are launched, this, I believe that this method will become even more accurate. Uh, as to old crow flats, I have seen that there is a great influence on ice regime or drainage and refilling events. And um, according to the most recent study of uh, McDonald and et al. in 2021, they mentioned that old crow flats are getting progressively wetter that the uh, water level is increasing, there is more influence of rainfall, and as a result, we're expecting to have more and more drainage events. So I believe that um, we could, would probably also have a transition to more bad fast ice as a result of those events. Uh, also, over the past 30 years, I saw that the fraction of bad fast ice has increased from about 12% to 25%, uh, despite warming climate. However, of course, more studies have to be done in the field. More data has to be collected to verify those trends and keep monitoring what is happening with lake ice. That's it for me. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Maria. Uh, we will now take questions. If you have any questions, please either type them in the chat or just unmute yourself. I see Joe, you have a question, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Maria. Um, that was a, a really nice presentation and very clear. Um, I had a question about your accuracy um, that you showed. I think you said it was basically kind of in the 90 to 99% and then something like averaging 95 or something like that. Can you can you go into that a little bit? I mean, cause that's like remarkably high and um, maybe I'm coming from the process-based modeling world where we don't nearly get as high. Um, can you go in a little more detail? Yeah, how sure, yeah. Okay, here. So uh, accuracy. It's like in any any um, machine learning classification. I collect a set and I reserve some of it for testing. So first of all, we have to consider how accurate is the set, the data set that I created. So this this accuracy does not reflect the accuracy of the set that I created by my visual labeling. So here we're just assessing how accurate is the model based on my labels. You know what I mean? So. Um, if my visual assessment mm -hmm. had had issues, it will not be reflected in this accuracy. Mm. Uh, the difference that we have 91 to 99, this is because of how, how I set it up. Uh, the model is sensitive to including or excluding some years of the data because I'm using different uh, sensors. Uh, so for example, if I take one year of data out and then I test, my model on that year and it was not part of the training set at all, the accuracy goes down. Uh, if I include all of my data and just reserve part of it, however, all, all the years I included, accuracy automatically goes up because the model becomes familiar with every single image. And for every image, we'll have different incidence angle. Um, maybe we have a uh, different number of scenes in every year. So it is sensitive to including or excluding some of the years. If you, if you, um, like, so you, so it, like, were you always doing temporal exclusions? Like, for example, where you leave a year out, were you also doing like spatial exclusions? So, say you take your, your domain and you kind of split it into a grid and you exclude like one of the blocks of your grid. Like, was that kind of, um, testing done? I didn't do the spatial. That's the next step, only temporal. So, so I did some testing when I included all of the years and just took out some points. Mm -hmm. Then um, I did testing training on all of the years, except for three years from different satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one was 
one year was completely reserved. It didn't participate in, in determining the best structure. It was completely left out. And then I tested on that year. So yeah, spatial, spatial testing is of course next step. And not only in the old crowd flats, it could be some other area also included to see how sensitive it is to, di to different areas, study areas. Okay. And then um, you mentioned that Old Crow Flats uh, is, seems to be getting wetter. Um, I, I believe you, you mentioned that as, as one of your kind of final things. Is that, I mean, is, are you finding that purely from your work or, or is that also found in like what other ways of looking at this system are finding? Like are, basically, are you consistent with what other people are finding? No, 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 it's not, it's not me. I just oh. mentioned that there is this recent study, recent study by McDonald et al. in 2021, just published. And they, they looked at isotopes in the water and they see that the lakes are becoming more and more rainfall dominated and the water levels are growing and they expecting it to, to drive more drainage events. Okay, okay, great. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for the question. Any other question for Maria? Well, if not, I do have some questions for you, uh, Maria. So just one thing I wanted to clarify. Um, so in, in creating your data set for the training of your uh, neural network, you hand labeled all of the images pixel by pixel. Wow. And then you started to see life in shades of gray because of that, or how much time did it took? It, it took probably about a month or two months. Yeah, a long time. A lot of clicking. My one of my mouses broke after oh. all the clicking. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah. All right. Um, and so other questions I have. Um, so I imagine that your approach and your method is something that would be scalable and applicable uh, elsewhere uh, on other sites or other regions. I'm ho I'm hoping so. I think I think if we wanted to be more general. We have to include more training data from different areas and different latitudes and different incidence angles. Um, but that's something definitely which would be interesting to see how this model works for other regions, which are not part of my training set. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing since it's trained on one specific region, it shouldn't perform as well on others. But yeah. Yeah. do you see it becoming something like a pipeline where it would be uh, some sort of frame, framework already implemented and people could just plug in their data and then or their training set and then train on the region that they want in terms of scalability. Well, that's, that's, that's the idea of deep learning is that we take a long time to train the model. And if we can include information from many regions, that would be better. And then this model is, is so general, it can work for all, all regions. This, this is the, the, the vision. All right. And you spoke also of uh, that one of the next step being uh, using spatial uh, instead of temporal. Uh, well, looking at spatial instead of temporal. Is there any other next step that you you see in this project or in this uh, research? Or is that the main next thing to I aim think, at? I think yeah. What what you've already mentioned, including more study areas, looking at how the model performs on them. Um, <clears throat> including definitely the spatial dimension because this classification doesn't consider at all the shape of the lake or what is adjacent to those pixels that we are classifying. So I think it would be much more accurate if it was considering what's what's around the pixel that it's classifying. Um, yeah, I think. I'm guessing also using convolutional neural networks since they're so good at, like you said, spatial patterns would be interesting to see uh, how they behave or perform using the spatial dimension. Yeah, so this convolutional neural network structure that I'm using, it allows for incorporating multiple dimensions. So for, for, for optical data, they also used different bands. So they had spectral dimension and temporal dimension, but also a spatial one would be good to add. For SAR images, the spectral dimension is not as relevant because it could be the polarization, but uh, we don't always have the same set of polarizations, so I think spatial and temporal are the, are the way to go. 
All right, thanks. Um, do we have any other question? If so, please just unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, I, I got one question. I, I hope it's not very, you know, silly. I'm just becoming familiar with the story. I just was wondering, uh, did you say that you label the pixel manually based on the backscatter value or you, you did have something like uh, other images from optical remote sensing or something or the field data uh, what how, how did you do that yeah so for, it was visual by visual assessment so i looked at uh, backscatter values i looked at uh, optical data as well i looked at um, incidence angle and what is known what, what is the relationship between backscatter and incidence angle in shown in previous studies consider, try to consider all of those factors. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Maria, for a great talk and being our first uh, speaker of the seminar series. Again, everyone, if someone here is interested in presenting, please reach out. And otherwise, uh, thank you again. And um, I'm hoping to see everyone here in the next uh, series. Thank you very much.